I will apologize. I'm going to have to keep hitting mute. I've managed to pick up a cold. It's not COVID, so that's a thing. But How many off-sites have you been to in the last you know, couple of months? Okay, so here's the thing. I haven't been to any off-sites. I have three coming up in the next four weeks. Whoa, that's many. Yep. I have three in the next four weeks, but I did just take a personal holiday on the weekend, and we did Halloween at Universal Studios. So I think every single wet ride I was on, I managed to get splashed directly in the face. So I think I just have, like, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean flu. And so that's, yeah, there's nothing worse than that. You drank the Disney uh, water. Yeah, (laughs) Disney and Universal. I managed to get it from everywhere. So So when we went to to Disney... We went on that Pirates of the Caribbean ride. It was the only one we went on because my wife screamed so loud while on that. An eight-year-old in front of us turned around and said, are you okay? (laughs) 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 She was scared so much by that one ride that (laughs) consequently we did not go on any other rides. And that was the first one that we went on. So Disney was a little bit disappointing for us. Well, you would not enjoy Universal then. Those rides are a fair titch more intense. I actually, I really enjoyed Universal as a world more than I did Disney. But I d- also did not go on any of the rides there either. Well, I did just about every single ride you can do. And it was it was something. I am evidently the roller coaster person in the family. So I have one that won't do spinny rides and one that won't do dark rides and one that won't do high rides. So I end up riding with all of those people. So (laughs) (laughs) that that sounds pretty good. Yes, we had our moments. Well, should we uh, get into the show? Let's. We've been talking a lot about not the show. Maybe get into the show. So let's get into some Watchtower Weekly. Of course, named in tribute to 1Password's Watchtower feature, which alerts you to any data breaches or reused passwords, generally things like that. And in this segment, we like to highlight some security headlines and breaking news, and that recently, some have caught our attention. And we share our reactions to them. So, this week, we're starting with a story about the Move It data breach. So, the biggest hack of the year of 2023 just keeps getting bigger. So this one's from Wired. Since the beginning of May, mass exploitation of a vulnerability in the widely used file transfer software MoveIt has allowed cybercriminals to steal data from a dizzying array of businesses and governments, including Shell, British Airways, and the United States Department of Energy. Progress Software, which owns MoveIt, patched the floor at the end of May, and broad adoption of the fix ultimately halted the rampage. But the Klopp data extortion gang... Uh, Hang on, their name is Klopp. That's a terrible name. That's like a one out of ten. I think that might be the worst that we have. That's not good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not That's not good. Like when someone says, oh, you know, my data's been extorted. Who did it? Klopp. I don't know. They sound like the bassist of a bad band. I'm thinking like the Amish and the horses and the, you know, how their horses say Klopp. Like, <laughs> you know, when they, they're the little, you know. I, I think it's actually a really good name for a horse. <laughs> It's a really good name for a horse. Maybe it's just, it's Canada, right? (laughs) You know, we're not good at like figuring out how to name ourselves as we become professional hackers. We're trying to be all friendly, you know, clop the horse. Yeah, come on, Matt. Cut them some slack. They're trying, they're just getting started. They're they're trying, okay? Okay. You know, clop the horse is here to extort your data. (laughs) (laughs) So the gang had already orchestrated a far-reaching smash and grab, and months later, the full extent of the damage is is still coming into view. In the coming months, more people, as many as tens of millions, could find out that their sensitive information has been compromised using MoveIt and this extortion. So in recent weeks, Ontario's government's birth registry, Born Ontario, do you think that's one of them ones that's like, it stands for something, but actually it's Born, because (laughs) it cries out for something like that, doesn't it? They said that they'd suffered a MoveIt-related attack earlier this year in which hackers stole sensitive personal data from 3.4 million people, including 2 million babies, as well as expectant parents and those seeking fertility care. Emily Austin, a security researcher, said of the breach, I don't think we're done hearing about this by any means. We're going to keep seeing that rolling disclosure over the probably the next few months. Austin points out that one of the nuances of the MoveIt situation is that it is a true software supply chain security issue. The vulnerabilities existed in two versions of the MoveIt service, 
the cloud service known as Move It Cloud and the local version that institutions run themselves on their own premises, known as Move It Transfer. The latter is where most of the exploitations occurred, but many organisations that had data stolen in Move It exploitation attacks weren't directly using it. Instead, they'd collaborated with a third party or contracted with a vendor that then did. So attackers were able to steal whatever data that they could grab from vulnerable systems like MoveIt, whether the information was from one institution or many. So centralised data repositories like MoveIt had also been particularly appealing targets to CLOP, which is known for strategically exploitating systems embedded in the software supply chain, including multiple file transfer tools. And earlier this year, Klopp claimed it breached more than 100 organizations by abusing the Go Anywhere file transfer tool. The gang also mounted a, a data extortion campaign at the end of 2020 by exploiting flaws in Acelion network equipment. The Mover incident eclipses them, though, both in the number of victim organisations and the individuals whose data was compromised. Uh, it's inevitable that there are corporate victims out there that don't yet know that they're victims, and there are individuals out there who don't yet know that they've been impacted. That was a quote from Brett Callow, a threat analyst at MC Software. Move it is especially significant simply because of the number of victims. Who those victims are, the sensitivity of this data that was obtained, and the multitudes of ways that it can be used. The fascinating thing about all of this to me is just the thing that essentially the, the EU are trying to do with privacy policies and having these things listed out. And when you add a new one, you have to email everybody and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm adding this new software, this piece of software that has your data in it into my supply chain. I think this is only going to push that wider. The more things that have access to your data that transfer information between one system to the other, I think it's really important to have a really good and detailed privacy policy so that when you do do things that add new supply chains and, and all that kind of thing into it, like you make people aware of that. But it seems to be that some of these services didn't even know that Move It or Move It Cloud or any of those actually had access to information because their supply chains were so long. So that that's the thing that kind of worries me about this is like, how many services does a service use? And like, how many services do they use? It's kind of terrifying and infinite. I think the thing that, that I'm finding most surprising here is how many people use this software that I don't think I've ever heard of. I'm in Ontario <laughs> yes. and I haven't heard of this breach of our birth registry. So, you know, it's it's one of those where it's, how do you even understand what's happening in the world some days? Meanwhile, I must be in a very silly mood because I'm over here trying not to lose my shit because you just did that. How many services does a services need? And I've got like, how much wood does a woodchuck chuck combined with, um, you know, <laughs> King Julian doing the move it, move it dance mm -hmm. with Clop the Oh my gosh. With Clop the horse standing there dancing along with King Julian. Like my brain is just completely lost at this morning. I am just, I'm having a good time with this story. You know, clop, move it. It's all good stuff. It's just, this could be a good animated feature. I was right, by the way. Born Ontario stands for Better Outcomes Registry and Network. Oh, that's horrible. Hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That, that's a real forced way to get to a um, an acronym. Yeah. Okay. So this next one, Tom Hanks warns fans about an AI version of him promoting a dental plan. <laughs> That's right. Tom Hanks is not informing fans to get their teeth cleaned. The Oscar-winning actor shared a computer-generated image of himself on Instagram recently, warning his followers about a promotional video for a dental plan circulating online. Hanks wrote, Beware, there's a video out there promoting some dental plan with an AI version of me. I have nothing to do with it. Tom Hanks has previously discussed the rise of artificial intelligence and deepfake technologies in the creative industries, saying on an episode of the Adam Buxton podcast that it's now possible for him to continue acting after his death. Anybody can recreate themselves at any age they are by the way of AI or deepfake technology. I could be hit by a bus tomorrow and that's it, but performances could go on and on and on. That's what Hank said. Outside the understanding of AI and deepfake, there'll be nothing to tell you that it's not me and me alone. And it's going to have some degree of lifelike quality. That's certainly an artistic challenge, but also a legal one. 
And Hanks went on to say that all of the guilds, all of the agencies, all of the legal firms are currently in discussion on the legal ramifications of his face and his voice and everyone else's being our own intellectual property. This is quite an interesting one. We don't usually cover this type of thing because really there's no cybersecurity element of this. But there is a real, you know, cultural thing here of, one, it's a bit creepy, and two, I wonder how many people would have actually noticed. I wonder how much attention we pay to advertising. And I wonder whether you could probably just get away with not hiring Tom Hanks and, like, just deep faking it. We watch most of our TV on streaming stuff, so there's not a lot of commercials, but the odd show we have has commercials. And so that's Dave's new favorite hobby, where it's how many of those people in the commercial are real versus fake. (laughs) And that's his new favorite thing to do, to try and figure out if they're real people or fake people, just because AI has gotten so good at creating these not really people people. And so it's how does that work? Like, how how do we figure out how people are in the world? Like, how does... How do we know if anyone is actually a thing? It's It actually reminds me of all the political ads where it's this ad is paid for by the campaign of whoever it is. The folks in the U.S. have all the time. How do you know if it's verified Tom Hanks really likes this toothpaste or if it's something completely different? I don't think critical media consumption is something that most of us are used to. No, I try to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> give, give me more mindless reality shows. I, I definitely don't want to think critically about the, the media I consume. But I do think a lot more of this is going to happen. And I I think it was actually part of the strikes that are going on. I think AI and things in general around the writer strike were kind of a central central column. Yeah. Yep. So this next one, say an encrypted hello to a more private internet. So this is something that Mozilla have launched. As web users, what we say and we do online is subject to pervasive surveillance. Although we typically associate online tracking with ad networks and other third-party sites, our online communications travel across commercial telecommunication networks, allowing them to siphon the names of websites we visit and monetize our browsing history. However, Mozilla has recently announced Enter Encrypted Chat Client Hello, which is ECH. It works on Firefox. By encrypting that first hello between your device and the website servers, sensitive information like the name of the website that you're visiting is protected against interception from unauthorized parties. ECH is now rolling out to Firefox users worldwide, allowing for a more secure and private browsing experience. So Mozilla claims that ECH is the most recent step in our mission to build a better internet, where privacy is one of the industry standards. And Mozilla has been developing this new internet privacy technology for nearly half a decade in collaboration with other browsers, infrastructure providers, academic researchers, and standards bodies like the Internet Engineering Task Force. So much of our data is shared through websites such as our passwords, credit card numbers, and cookies. And these are all protected with cryptographic protocols like Transport Layer Security, TLS. ECH is a new TLS extension that protects the identity of the website that we're visiting, filling the privacy gap in our existing online security infrastructure. So what do we think of this one? I like, I think it's good, but like, this should be a standard, right? This should be something that all browsers kind of build in order to have these things to be a more private internet and not to just be a, you know, a Firefox thing. It sounds like it might be part of the standard. The way that they described it, it's an extension on TLS, which means that it may not be proprietary. You know, reading the post, it sounds like it is something that is built into Firefox, but I don't see any reason why other browsers couldn't couldn't take something similar, right? It's a really cool idea, I will say that. This feels like it cuts the legs out from underneath the sort of arms race that exists between advertisers and, and browser manufacturers around being able to track if they can't even identify the websites that you're visiting. I think that's that's a really nice nice touch. It reminds me of the when we had the big switch from HTTP to HTTPS. Now everything is HTTPS. Like you you wouldn't go to an HTTP website. So hopefully that, you know, ongoing quest to just make everything easier and more secure is something that we just continue to have happen. Yeah. Yep. Nice. So with that, I think we can move on to my chat with friend of the show i think like we can we can have levels of, of friend of the show uh, <laughs> graham cluley friend of the show been on a couple of times now 
I think this was the third time that we've had Graham on the show, and it never gets old catching up with him and hearing his unique takes on the cybersecurity landscape. Graham is, of course, the host of the Smashing Security podcast. You can check out a couple of the episodes that I've been a guest on there, too. So it's always a good time to sit down together and chat about all things podcasting and security. So, wait, so we just drop it in here, then? Nope. Nope, we're not going to say that. Oh, okay, we're not going to, okay. There's no dropping. (laughs) (laughs) Returning on the show for a hat-trick appearance today is Graham Cluley. (laughs) Graham is a security writer and blogger, but probably best known for hosting the fellow cybersecurity podcast, Smashing Security. So welcome back to the show, Graham. How are things? Oh, very well. Thank you very much for inviting me back on Random But Memorable. Real pleasure to be here. Everything's good here. I recently moved house, but uh, other than being surrounded by lots of cardboard boxes and an excess of sofas... If anyone, by the way, can I use this podcast to say, if anyone would like a sofa, (laughs) I can't give it away for love nor money. And I did read this morning that FreeCycle has had a a data breach. I think I read that on your site. So maybe don't put it on there. And this is the reason why I found out about the data breach at FreeCycle is that I have been putting this ruddy sofa up there. and (laughs) And so I went up there to see if anyone had responded. And I was greeted by a message telling everyone that my password had been stolen, as had everyone else's as well. So... Yeah, not good news for them. So we're going to talk about kind of all your years of writing and and security and generally the the cybersecurity landscape. Yeah. Uh, And I think that's probably a great place to start. You've been doing this for for a number of years. Far too long. How has really the the cybersecurity landscape changed since you started? So my first professional day in the cybersecurity industry was in January 1992. Can you believe when I was writing antivirus software for a company called Dr. Solomon's? And in those days, we saw, I think it was about 200 new viruses every month. And people told us that was a lot. And we used to send out updates on floppy disk. (laughs) (laughs) And most people received their updates every three months. They didn't need them more regularly than that because viruses didn't spread very quickly. Most people weren't on the internet. It was just things being transferred via sneaker net. People taken a floppy disk from one computer to another. So the situation we have now is that there are millions and millions of attacks every day. So one of the big things that's changed is the volume. There's just such an enormous industry, a conveyor belt of cybercrime going on all the time because everyone's online, everyone's got a computer in their pocket, everyone's doing everything online rather than on pen and paper or the old-fashioned way, using old-fashioned telephones and notepads. So the volume, that's definitely changed. The other thing, the other amazing thing which I would never have expected was way back then it was all kids in their back bedrooms doing it as a sort of form of electronic graffiti. And of course, what happened was that we began to see state-sponsored attacks it's pure James Bond. It's pure, utter science fiction. If, if you came to someone in 1992 and said one day the Chinese government will be planting malware or stealing passwords from other people or breaking into computers, you'd think, oh, come off it. How likely is that to be happening? You know, it's much more likely they'd be parachuting someone behind enemy lines. So now, of course, we see countries spying on each other, stealing information, launching attacks, disrupting systems. And the final thing, of course, and maybe the biggest change of all is money, because now cybercrime doesn't just make money, it makes huge amounts of money. Through business email compromise, through ransomware, the amounts that criminal gangs are able to make. And I'm sure we've seen criminal gangs move from old-fashioned crime into cybercrime. They've realised maybe it's a safer thing to do and maybe more profitable as well. So money has changed everything, both, of course, for the, the vendors as well as the criminals. So there's lots of money to be made for the vendors. Computer security is a hot industry to be in. It's something which companies continue to invest in. They're not cutting back on that particularly. And cybercrime, of course, has just escalated because of the sheer amount of money which can be made. So those are the three big things which have changed, I think. It probably happened in sequence as well. Yeah. The more infrastructure that went online, the more money went online, the bigger the state actors and the money was to be made in grouping and bringing cybercrime up. Yeah. Do you think we'll see like a lad Bible-esque interview with a cyber criminal in in like 10 years, (laughs) uh, like we do kind of gangsters now? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, in a way, we, we already do. I mean, there are cyber criminals who've been caught. Some of them have gone to prison. 
And they then, once they get out, they set up cybersecurity consultancies because they pitch themselves as poacher turned gamekeeper, don't they? Yeah. And uh, some of them have absolutely rested on the laurels of their notoriety in order to make them a, a substantial amount of money. And that, I have to be honest, that really riles me that people who've shown this real lack of ethics have actually been able to have a more successful career in some cases than the people who remained honest and the people who got on with the job and were worked in IT security departments and weren't making headlines. So, you know, sometimes I kind of think, you know, maybe we shouldn't celebrate these guys as being such heroes. And let's not forget, they got caught. You know, <laughs> yes. they weren't as smart as they sometimes claim. <laughs> maybe the real smart ones, the ones we never hear of, who continue to make their millions. There are a few I won't name names, but like there are a few as well who stay on that side of the fence and kind of like preach how dangerous it is on on that side of the fence rather than like if I take this back to gangsters, Mm. there are gangsters that come out of prison after after doing a long stint for their crimes and their sole purpose is to teach other people not to do this. Yes. But we don't see the same in in cybersecurity. The preachers that do come out of prison, they mostly talk about here's my life story and, and here's what I managed to do. Absolutely. This isn't possible anymore, but like you could probably do something like it. This is not a great role model to some extent. I was emceeing an an event a couple of years ago and they had this guy on who was a hacker who'd been caught and he stood up there for 45 minutes and the audience were lapping it up as he was telling all these stories. This is how I hacked these guys. This is how I hacked these guys. And I thought, when are you going to get onto the bit where you say what you did was wrong? When are you going to get to the bit where you say, don't do what I did? I realise now that I caused harm that I cost companies money. I may, you know, and if companies lose money, they may have to make redundancies. They may have to let people go. You know, there's an impact on real people. Mm -hmm. But he was sort of celebrating. And to be honest, I was really knocked off. (laughs) And I thought, no, you should be putting effort as well into going to classes where there are young kids who are beginning to dabble into these areas, who are at risk of maybe entering the criminal underworld and saying, don't do this because actually... What happened was really bad. And going to jail or whatever the sentence was that they got was a horrible experience and really traumatic for my family and my friends and has cast a shadow over the rest of my career. So, you know, they can still make a career. They can. But I just want a little bit of repentance. Instead of jumping straight to here's how you protect against hacks like the one I did. (laughs) <laughs> like right yeah <laughs> which is where most of the like immediately go right i don't know maybe i'm a bit of a stick in the mud i mean i i am getting old <laughs> so maybe i have to recognize you know new generations are different from what i was but when i started in antivirus for instance we had a very simple rule when we were hiring people is if people were too enthusiastic about computer viruses, we wouldn't hire them. Because, <laughs> or if they had any history of writing something like So people ask me all the time, did you ever write a virus? Absolutely not. No, I never did. I could have done, but I had a sense of ethics and morals inside myself that I didn't think it would be right for my code to run on someone else's computer without their permission and cause some sort of harm. So frustrates me sometimes but i would love those people who've obviously taken the wrong path maybe to make a more determined decision to not only go by the right path but actually prevent others from taking the wrong path as well and and some people just you know kind of dive deeper and deeper down this hole do you remember anything that you've covered that has like stuck out as particularly wild mind-boggling or, or generally just interesting as as people kind of fall down this rabbit hole of cybercrime. Yeah, it's not really a cybercrime event, but I'll tell you something. This is the most bonkers thing which I've ever heard of. it, And it happened, oh, 10, 11 years ago. So I'm sorry, this isn't very recent. But the craziest story I ever heard was about a dating site, an unusual dating site called Beautiful People. And Beautiful People... All these dating sites got, you know, they've got some sort of gimmick, haven't they? Like it's uniform dating or whatever it is. You know, there's something which is your particular niche. This particular dating site only allowed really beautiful people to join the site. And the way in which it decided if you were beautiful or not is the current members of the site got to vote on new applicants. And you could decide if they were attractive enough to join. I can already see... The, 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 like, the slippery slope downwards here. <laughs> so in 2011, this website, Beautiful People, issued a press release saying 
they'd been hacked. They said that a virus had hit their computer system, specifically it hit their gate, as it were, as to whether to allow people in or not. They called it the Shrek virus. And they said it allowed everyone who applied onto the site. And they said as a consequence, they'd had to throw out over 30,000 new members. And in their press release, they said, we're really regretful for this, these unfortunate people who've, who've been now excluded from beautiful people. Because for a short while, they said they thought they were beautiful. It must be a bitter pill to swallow, they wrote, but better to have had a slice of heaven than never to have tasted it at all. Oh, my goodness. Now, this story got covered everywhere by the press. MSNBC, The Register, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, CNN, everyone wrote this up as fact. Dating site got hit by the Shrek virus, allowed ugly people to join. And I was working for an antivirus company at the time. And I thought, I don't believe this. I don't believe there's a virus which does this. Seems very strange. So I contacted them and I said, can you send me a copy of the virus? Because surely we need to protect other dating sites. And they said, oh, no, no, no. They said, we're not sharing the virus with members of the cybersecurity community to analyse. We're handling it all internally. I thought, it's interesting. As a dating site operator, are you able to analyse a computer virus? Anyway, it turned out, of course, that it was absolute nonsense. They said that this virus had messed around with the gateway into their site, but it hadn't impacted in any way the current proper members. It hadn't, no data had been breached. They said purely this gateway had been. So it was complete phony and they did it for publicity. So it's a really rare example of a company saying they had been hacked when they hadn't, whereas most companies try to <laughs> cover up a hack or sweep it under the carpet or not make a big deal of it. This one did it to get publicity and they thought it would do no damage. Now, the beautiful thing about this story is that two years later, beautiful people got hacked for real and they did lose their membership database and whether you like walks on the beach or pina coladas and all the other information uh, about their members. Bad for their members, of course, but you kind of think, well, they kind of deserved it by pretending to have been hacked by a mythical virus in the first place. That definitely took some turns. <laughs> My, my initial assumption was that it was going to go down the rabbit hole of, like, someone letting themselves in and then changing the voting script to, like, slowly over time. You're very devious, Matt. That's that's a... <laughs> I, t I mean, that's, that's where my brain went. It was just, I wonder how I can, you know, slowly only invite, like, one specific type of person to this. And then sooner or later, it just becomes, like, where everybody, you know, likes horses or something like that. Like yes. You could just, yeah. you could infiltrate and, uh, <laughs> and execute something like that. It turned out this website, when I did my research into them, it turned out that they had previously won competitions for their imaginative PR stunts. Ah. So there'd been another occasion about 18 months earlier when they'd said we had to chuck out 10,000 people after they put on weight over Christmas and were no longer considered beautiful. And I thought, again, that's not true. Because, of course, on a dating site, you don't update your profile to say that you've put weight on. Yeah. You know, that's the last thing you do. You, you don't even use a current picture of yourself. You use the one from three years ago when you were on holiday and you had your beach body. <laughs> the fundamental rules of dating sites. So they had a history of doing this. They got themselves loads of publicity each time. But eventually it bit them in the bottom. I'm sure someone is planning, has an idea and is pitching a startup for like beautiful people too, where <laughs> you have to connect your fitness wearable. Ah, yes. And your bathroom scales that are Wi-Fi enabled. And, uh, you know, you have to you have to do a liveness check. Uh, or you're, or <laughs> connecting all of these like seemingly innocuous things together, but just ensuring that you're a hundred percent beautiful. Yeah, like I, I'm sure some AI can judge now the whether whether you're beautiful or not. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm sure there's there's kind of strange and, and creative wording and terminology in a number of these stories that you've covered. H how many have you found that that have really kind of spiked your interest around oh. like buzzwords or, or jargon? Like, what, what, what's your favourite one that has come up recently? Oh, favourite ones. It really annoys me, all these buzzwords that are being used all the time. And you just can't get away from them, can you? First we had fishing, then we had smishing, then we had vishing. And it's just like, for goodness sake, you know, can we not? Do it? I, I think sometimes that as an industry, we really gravitate towards these. I sometimes get requests from Jenna saying, can you tell me about, and they put a random sequence of letters. And I'm literally, 
I have no idea what they're talking about. And I have to go on to Google and think, well, if, what is this that they're actually asking me about? And what does that really mean? The favourite one which I ever had was one used by a former colleague of mine, Paul Duckling, who now works at Sophis. And he has one which is called Vori Wogum. And that stands for Voice of Reason in a World Gone Mad, <laughs> which I think is something which probably random but memorable. I think you probably believe in that one quite strongly. There's one I do love, which is Teotwaki, which is <laughs> the end of the world as we know it, which, of course, we hear about, well, most Thursdays, really, don't we, in the cybersecurity world, being told it's, it's the end of everything and this, this whole new thing. Right now, of course, we're surrounded by all this generative AI talk and chit-chat. But every security company out there is now saying, well, we've got to say we've got AI. We have to have machine learning. We, well, actually, machine learning, I think, is yesterday's news. But, you know, we, we have to have this kind of component into our technology. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to compete. And some of these things are things that products and services have had for years. They just haven't been dressed up using these particular phrases. I am starting to see it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the thing that gets me is I use chat GPT and, and others for like small tasks and wording things better. Mm. I can't help but think what that would be like if it encompassed all of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> there would be some part of it which is lies and there'd be some part of it which is just absolute nonsense, but done to sound correct. So I, I'm not sure I want it in my notes, to be honest. And these things, they're all being fed by content which is already out there on the web. So as more and more people write stuff using the likes of ChatGPT, it's going to be ChatGPT regurgitating what ChatGPT has previously written. I, don't, oh, I sound such a grumpy old man. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do think it is. It's going to raise the bottom line, but I think it's also going to lower the top line of quality. Right. In terms of cybersecurity, it's going to democratise attacks, I think. I think we're going to start seeing that with deep fakes as well. There, there have been reports of CEOs who've been defrauded for millions. They've been thought they were speaking to like the group chairman or whatever. They moved millions into an account. And they say, well, it was because there was a deep fake call. And so it sounded just like my boss. And that's why I did it. And when I see these reports, I think, well, how do they know it was deep fake? It was just on the phone. How do they know it wasn't just someone doing an impression of him? How do they know it wasn't Rory Bremner <laughs> or John Coleshaw, who was simply doing a convincing impression of somebody? Very true. But I, I do a fantastic Alfred Hitchcock impression. <laughs> and, you know, I think I could probably... Con and of course, he's dead, so he's unlikely to be phoning you. But yeah, I, I just think sometimes people are going to start blaming deep fakes and chat GPT and AI, just like they're blaming state-sponsored hackers. And it's just like, oh, come on, guys. You just need the normal checks and provisions and a bit of technology in place and some procedures to prevent your company from falling for some of these things. Yeah, very true. I mean, it is true that we've... I mean, I, I, I've played around with it. It is amazing. It does an incredible job at, at pretending to be other people. And we've all seen the deep fake Tom Cruise, and you can go on YouTube and see dead artists singing modern songs. And who knows where we're going to be in two years' time, because this has moved so quickly. And that is kind of terrifying, but I just think we need a little bit of scepticism when everyone starts to blame the technology. <laughs> yes, very true. We'll see. And again, from the cybersecurity point of view, lots of new things for people to find out and learn about how to protect themselves on these different services, how to set up the settings, what to be aware of. There are subtleties and the differences in the way some of these things work, which may mean you're not being as private as you imagined you were. You know, it's a, it's a confusing time. That's a very good point, actually. Do you have any other current go-to security tips or advice for listeners maybe ones that you give friends family when when down the pub so i don't drink so i don't go down the pub but and probably no one would want to drink with me anyway because i'm a grumpy old man <laughs> but <laughs> so um the other day i was in sweden i was given a talk over there and so of course i get in a taxi from the airport to the venue and so i have these conversations for half an hour or so and people say what do you do and i explain what they do and we get onto the topic and they say, well, what should I do? And it's always the same advice because I think I've, I've only got a short amount of time. I can't get too nerdy. What can I do to make a difference? The top one is get yourself a password manager. 
It's actually, the top one is actually use different passwords on different websites. Stop using the same password because you can be sure the taxi driver and indeed most of the people you encounter in regular life are reusing the same passwords Mm -hmm. in different places. So use different passwords. That inevitably gets them to say, well, how am I going to remember all these passwords? And that's when you say you get yourself a password manager, which will also generate the passwords randomly for you, which will also provide a level of protection against phishing because they won't pop up an offer to enter your credentials if they don't recognize the domain name as being for that particular password entry. So it's fantastic. So get yourself a password manager. It's got to be the first advice. The other thing I think say to people, once once they've swallowed that one, I then say, okay, for dessert, I'm going to tell you to turn on multi-factor authentication for as many accounts as you can. So when your password does get fished from you, when you make a mistake, or if you have made the mistake of reusing passwords, you've got an additional layer of security there. Now, of course, there are ways, there are tricks for getting around multi-factor authentication by the cyber criminals, but it requires a lot more effort by the criminal, and normally they don't bother. And the final one is keep your computer patched and up to date with the latest security patches. You know, run security software on your computer. Don't think that magic crystals sitting on your bookshelf are going to somehow defend your computer or oh I've got a Mac and therefore I don't have to worry none of that nonsense get yourself security software and keep it updated perfect I think that's some great advice where can people go to find out more about you or the uh, smashing security podcast very simple I've got a website grahamcluley.com cluley is c-l-u-l-e-y.com graham as in the crackers if you're an American. And if you're interested in Smashing Security, which is a fellow podcast to Random But Memorable, just look up Smashing Security wherever you find your podcast, a smashing with a G. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been real fun, Matt. Thanks very much. So now it's time for Did You Know? Uh, This is a fairly new segment where we like to share a short, bite-sized one password or security tip that our listeners might not know about uh, we also like to throw in a few recommendations of things we've been loving lately too whether it be an app or a board game a podcast an audiobook it anything is fair game here uh, so this week i wanted to cover something that i find particularly useful in one password which is tags now with tags there's truly no limit to the number of tags you can create and some things i would personally suggest would be a finance tag for your bank accounts and credit cards, a health tag for your health insurance, your gym memberships, your fitness apps, uh, an insurance tag for all your insurance policies. You get the idea. Anything that will help you find related items when you need them. You can use multiple tags on a single item like health and insurance to help narrow down your search later. You can also favorite items. Some things I like to favorite are uh, my Apple ID or uh, the kids' screen time passcode or my amazon account because i have an extra pin code on there for video purchases so things that i need to access very quickly i mark as favorites another great thing that i find you can use tags for is things like any sites where you have a phone an address or a credit card stored so that when you move home or if you lose your wallet and get a new card you can have a whole list of action items you can use tags for things like status labels. So if you legally change your name and have to update it on websites, you can have tags like name change requested or name change document sent and really organize everything that you have in 1Password so it's easy to find and you can you can sort of shape 1Password to, to work the way that, that you think. It's very cool. Give tags a try. Do you know what I do to make my data organized? Because I don't use tags. I just create new vaults. Like we just had this trip. So I created a vault for the trip. I put down like some secure notes with all the reservation IDs. I copied all the passports into that vault. And then I just have the single vault. I share it with the travelers and the going. And then everything is all in that vault ready to go. And then I can just archive the vault when I get home. Like that to me is super easy, super slick. It totally confuses Watchtower because now I have all these duplicate items. But, you know, (laughs) we're going to take the wins where we can get them. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of tags, we actually already have some incredible tip-related entries from our Cybersecurity Awareness Month giveaway that we're running throughout the month of October. This one is from Randy, who says, I have been using 1Password for about the last six months. I decided to leave my former password manager after they got hacked i searched the internet for all the different password manager options and decided one password was the best solution for me once i started using one password i was trying to figure out a way to somehow put an indicator on all of my items i have just under 
200 of them. I needed to do this so that I could begin the arduous task of changing all of my passwords. I searched and posted in the 1Password community discussion boards and ended up using one of the suggestions and added a to-do tag on all of my items. To do this, I bulk added the tag by selecting all items, then dragging the selection to the tag in the sidebar. Uh, Good use of drag and drop, Randy. Well done. This put the to-do tag on every single item, and then I began to change my passwords and remove the tag one at a time. This way, I can go to the to-do tag, see how many passwords I have left to change. I really love 1Password and have purchased the family plan so that my family can use it as well. Keep up the good work. Uh, That's a solid tip from Randy, uh, who now has... I love that tip. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, Randy has now won one free year of 1Password, so congratulations, Randy. Thank you, Randy. Uh, And also, like, I I feel sorry for you that you have to change all of your passwords. Like, that sounds arduous. That's many. Like, that is an arduous task. That's many. That's like, just sit down with your laptop in front of the TV at night and just churn through it while you're watching reruns of The Office or something. Like, it's a lot. The American office, by the way, not the British office. Uh Uh-huh. Both are great. True. Very true. And if you want to be in the chance of winning a free year of 1Password, all you need to do is write into the show with your favorite 1Password tip or fun use case, and we'll read out some of our favorites on the show. We'd love to hear how you're using 1Password and how it helps you on the day to day. Remember, we don't care how wacky or niche your tips or use case is. We love hearing your stories. You can write into the show at podcast at 1Password.com or post something on threads uh, with the hashtag RBM giveaway. We're running this giveaway throughout the month of October for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, so entries will be closed by October 25th, and we'll announce any final winners on the episode at the end of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is October 31st. I I think we're supposed to come up with things that we've been recommending recently or or addicted to, but I've got a really boring one this week, something that probably no one is wanting to use that isn't already using. I can't wait to hear it. This is a standard service if you enjoy music at the moment, which is like... You can use Apple Music, or you can use Spotify, or you can use any of the other ones. But, like, I'm really enjoying Spotify at the moment. Not very much their UI, which I think has got a bit crowded. But they do have something called a day list, which changes daily. And it learns from what you listen around the service at different times of the day. So sometimes I listen to, like, you know, 70s disco on a Wednesday... And then sometimes I'll listen to like post rock on a Friday and alternative on a Thursday, all this kind of stuff. And then it's just like, hey, this time last week you were listening to this. Would you like to listen to this again? This is so good. It's all AI playlists and they have AI DJs as well, which I I don't like putting DJs out of work. But this is pretty cool. You can have someone that's like introductory to like a section of songs and someone who's literally there for you creating playlists and like hey try this next three songs and if you don't like it let me know what you want to listen to it's really neat that's very very cool i like that a lot i thought you were going to suggest listening to the radio i thought you were legit going to put a plug in for your radio show (laughs) (laughs) no so i i log on to the the day list now and it's new romantic 80s pop wednesday afternoon So you listen to Melodic and Chill House on Wednesday afternoons. Here's some new romantic 80s pop new wave. Very cool. There we go. All right. It is time for everyone's favorite game show at the end of Random But Memorable. It is Hacker No Hacker. In a world where hacker group names are either effortlessly cool or pure parody and cliche, each week we try to guess if these hacker names are real or fake. And it's that time again where we get to play the Hacker No Hacker jingle. Hacker, no hacker, is it real or fake? Ba doom doom doom. Hacker, no hacker, real or a mistake? Okay, I legit want Anna to drop in the Move It, Move It song <laughs> so I can laugh along <laughs> and think about Clop doing their like fancy dance as they <laughs> they hop into the Move It breakdown <laughs> hacking effort. I hope Clop is one of the Hacker No Hacker names this week. All right, so I have gotten supremely tired of losing this game, and Anna has graciously allowed me to host this week so that I don't have to lose. And instead, Sarah and Matt are going to go head-to-head. The first hacker name, hacker group name, is Spark Aberration. Is this real? Is this fake? Well, I'm going to go fake. Because that word aberration is a very difficult word to say and spell. Yeah. I'm going to go fake too. It just it does just doesn't sound very cool, does it? No, it doesn't. 
It doesn't. And and it's not. It's it is it is indeed fake. This is not one that is out in the world. So congratulations. One point to each of you. Next up, we have Armada Collective. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this sound like a 90s group of DJs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go real on this one. Oh. I think the word armada is suitably military that someone might think it's cool. Yeah, it sounds very like early 2010s. I'm going to go real as well. Okay. All right. At least four private email providers were taken offline by distributed denial of service attacks carried out by the Armada Collective, including Proton Mail and Hush Mail. Proton Mail paid a ransom of 15 Bitcoin, it's around $6,000, to the hackers who threatened to continue flooding its data center. Congratulations. Another point for the two of you. Next up, we have Team Poison. <laughs> I'm going to go fake on that one. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm getting real. This group gained notoriety in 2011 or 2012 for its black hat hacking activities, which included attacks on the United Nations, NASA, NATO, Facebook, Minecraft forums, like really, like NASA, NATO, and the Minecraft forums, uh, and several other large corporations and government entities. Team Poison disbanded in 2012 following the arrest of some of its core members. All right, next up, we have Grim Nightmare. Oh, I got to go real for that one. Um, yeah, I'm going I'm going fake on that one just because like I I think it's near Halloween. It's and I'm being too imaginative. <laughs> well, I am Sarah, I'm so sorry Matt extends his lead by 2 at this point. Yeah. Oh. Whew, that is indeed fake. Oh, man. All right, next up, uh we have hacking team. All one word. Camel case, hacking team. What did you say? Camel case. Camel case. Yeah. What? I don't. I've never heard that before. It's where the letters in the in a single word thing are capitalized in this way. I mean, technically, this is sentence case because the first letter is capitalized. <sighs> okay. Great. Anyway, hacking team. <laughs> Real or fake, people? <laughs> I'm gonna go fake. Uh, I'm gonna go fake too. Hacking team is so unimaginative. Hacking Team was a Milan-based IT company that sold offensive intrusion oh. and surveillance capabilities to governments, law enforcement agencies, and corporations. Its remote control systems enable governments and corporations to monitor the communications of internet users, decipher their encrypted files and emails, record Skype and other communications, and remotely activate microphones and cameras on target computers. So the only thing honest about them is their name. No points for either of you. Mm. All right. Last one to bring it home here is Rebel Oblivion. Why, why are they all like two words this week? I don't know. And it's gone with a theme. You're winning. Why are you complaining? I, just... I was going to say, I don't even know. I can't even catch up now. This is. No, Sarah, the best you can do is not be so far behind. Mm, I, I'm saying fake. Okay. I'm going to go real then just because. You know, you're either going to completely trounce me or I'm going to pull ahead and, you know, kind of almost tie it. Yes. No, uh, this is indeed a proper rinsing. Uh, Matt takes, uh, takes the cake here. That is a fake, a fake hacker name. Congratulations, Matt. Well done. And Sarah, I know exactly how you feel. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. All right. Well, this has been it's been a lovely, a lovely, very fast hour uh, that we've spent together. It probably edited down to around thirty minutes, though. So uh... <laughs> take uh, all the things that we can't say but did say anyway, yep. um, and you end up with thirty minutes. End up with thirty minutes. It's probably going to be closer to twenty-five this week. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I've been real off my, really off my game today. I, I had to take this one in the in the basement because we've got contractors up next to the podcast studio, so it's just a whole. It's a whole thing. I'm I'm all I'm all off my rocker. I'm telling you, put on the move it, move it song. Get some King Julian dancing in the background. Oh, get the gosh. horse from Rapunzel. Pretend that horse's name is Klopp. <laughs> You'll be having a great time. It'll be the afternoon you never imagined you could possibly have. I'm telling you. Yeah. Welcome to my dream world. Well, You're right. What a way to end the show. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, love you both. Love you both. Love you both. Bye bye.
my my favorite part of that was where you just missed out all the connective words between sentences and just glossed over them. <laughs> <laughs> Did I really? Is it terrible? Should I do it again? <laughs> no. Okay, great. I haven't got the patience for it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my favorite part of these episodes are the little jabs between us. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> oh, dear.